What's up everybody? Today I'm going to continue my series of the most common AP Physics test questions. Today the subject is going to be circular motion and gravitation. Let's get started. The number one thing you're going to be expected now to do is to determine vector directions for three things. Centripetal force, centripetal acceleration, which are both the same, always towards the center, and then linear velocity, which will always be tangent to the circle. So for example, if you have a mass moving in a circle, maybe it's tied to a string, for example, and it's moving, let's say, in this direction. Well, to keep this in the circle, you need to have a force on the string pulling it towards the center. And you also need an acceleration, because that's what changes the direction here. Now the velocity itself would be moving this direction. So if I draw it somewhere else, the velocity again would be tangent to the circle and your acceleration and force always to the center. So the key is no matter what, just think towards the center, towards the center, towards the center for acceleration and force. Another problem you might see similar to this Let's say as the mass is going in the circle, they say, oh, we're going to cut the string, let's say, right here. We're going to cut the string right here. What happens to the mass? What does it do? Well, if you notice, the velocity is going straight up at that point, and so the mass is just going to continue in a straight line like this. Or if we cut it over here, it's going to continue in a straight line this way, etc., etc. So the main equation for centripetal motion is AC equals V squared over R, and you should definitely expect to use this at some point. I'm going to go through the most common problem that you'll see with this is the vertical circular motion problem. So for example, let's say you have a roller coaster moving in a loop-to-loop. -loop. At the bottom, it's uh, right side up. At the top, it's going to be upside down. And they ask you some questions like what keeps it in the circle? Well, for this, you should know how to do your free body diagram. So as normal, usual, you'd have gravity going down. But in this case, there's a normal force pulling up, but the normal force is actually going to be larger than gravity. Because remember, the net centripetal force needs to be towards the center. So the normal force has to be larger than gravity for that to happen. So if we set up our summation, for example, we would go the normal force is going up, gravity is going down, and then that equals our MAC. So our normal force, notice, is going to be MAC, which is MV squared over R, plus the force of gravity, MG. So again, normal force is going to be larger. Notice we're taking gravity. It's going to be larger than gravity. Gravity plus that centripetal force pulling upwards. Now what about at the top of the loop? So at the top of the loop, we still have gravity coming down, but this time the track is pushing down as well. So they're both pushing down. So in this case, they both contribute to the centripetal force going down, right? So if you notice, when we do our summation, we're going to have the force of gravity and I'll put negative here since it's down. And then we also have the normal force going down as well. And that equals MAC. But the acceleration is also going down, right? It's always to the center. And so that's negative. So the key is noticing that all three of these terms are in the same direction. And so when we solve for the normal force, we're going to get our MAC minus the force of gravity. So notice our normal force compared to at the bottom. Remember at the bottom the normal force has to be really big to keep us in the circle. In this case our normal force is much smaller. So we'll say normal force at the top is smaller than the normal force at the bottom. And that's because at the bottom the normal force has to overcome gravity to keep you in the circle. But at the top the normal force and gravity together are providing that centripetal force to keep you in the circle. 
Uh, another variation of this at the top, they might ask you what is the minimum speed to keep you in the circle, to stay in circle, right? So at this point, you say, well, when you barely make it around, then the normal force is going to be zero in this situation. And only gravity is providing the centripetal force to keep you in that circle. So notice when we do that, uh, normal force is zero, right? When the normal force is zero, then you just have Fg, which is mg, should equal mac. Masses do cancel, and you just have g equals v squared over r. Number three is what I refer to as concept math. And to be honest, I could have done this slide with every single one of these videos. You 100% will see several conceptual math questions. So what do I mean by this? I mean, if they ask a question like, if blah blah doubles, if something doubles, what happens to something else? So if the velocity doubles, what happens to the kinetic energy or the distance or the work? Something like that. The reason I included it in this video is the absolute most common one is the gravitational conceptual math question. So for example, you have a random planet that let's say is twice the mass of Earth and it has three times the radius of Earth and they say, what is little g on that planet? Well, a governing equation here is Newton's law of gravitation and the key is you just look at proportionalities, right? So our force is proportional to acceleration, which is proportional to the mass over the radius squared. So you just say, okay, if the mass is doubled, it's going to be twice as big. And if the radius is tripled, well, that's going to be three, but three squared times as big. So in other words, it's going to be two times three squared or nine times smaller. So two times bigger, nine times smaller means it's going to be two ninth. And that's all you do. So one other example, let's say it's uh, one fourth the mass, but it is one third the radius. So what do you do? Well, the mass is one fourth. The radius is one third squared. So what do you get? Well, the first one would be one fourth as big. The second would be three squared or nine times bigger. And so the final answer would be nine fourths. So anyways, you could do this with any equation and you should again see several of these, but this is the absolute most common. Question number four is the circular orbit question. So you should definitely know the derivation for this. So if you have a, like a planet going in orbit around the sun and um, the thing that keeps it in the circle is you have the force of gravity, right? So you should know how to derive this equation. So I'll go ahead and drive it for you here. So the force of gravity is the thing that keeps you in the circle. Now this is a centripetal force here keeping us in the circle. The equation for the force of gravity is big G times the two m's. So one would be the mass of the sun, and then let's just say this is the mass of earth, for example. And then we'll divide this by the distance between them, r squared. So this would be the radius of our circle, right? It's also the distance between. And then this equals, remember this mass right here is always the mass going in the circle. So in this case, that would be the mass of earth. And then we'll use our ac equation, which is v squared over r, Notice that the m of Earth does cancel, and one radius cancels as well. So what you're left with is g, big G times the mass of the sun divided by the distance between, and that's going to be equal to the v squared. So a question they might ask you here, they might say, oh, if the mass of the sun is, let's say it's doubled, what has to be true about the velocity around the planet? 
So kind of using the concept uh, that we just talked about, since mass is proportional to V squared, if the mass was doubled, then that means the velocity would have to be square root 2 times as big, or approximately 1.4 times the velocity. So make sure you know how to derive the orbit question, and then usually they might ask you like a conceptual math question along with it. So this is also a common question that's fairly easy. If you have a mass going around in a circle and they want to know the velocity, well, you just remember the velocity is distance over time. And for one full revolution, you're going a circumference, right? So 2 pi r is the total distance you go. And then the time it takes is what we call the period. And that's the time for one full revolution. So to find the velocity, it's just going to be 2 pi r divided by t. So I'm going to throw in a bonus question here. That is the elliptical orbit. You're not going to be re really using centripetal motion to solve this, but it is very common. And there's three concepts you need to know. And that is, as you move closer to the sun, you're moving faster. Mechanical energy is always going to be conserved and angular momentum is also going to be conserved. So for example, if I have a planet moving this way around the sun, the key thing to know is like when we're close to the sun, we're going to be moving faster here. And if we're moving faster, then obviously our kinetic energy is going up. And we're also closer to the sun, right? So then our potential energy is going down but the mechanical energy is staying the same. Same thing when you move away. This time our potential energy is increasing, our kinetic energy is decreasing, and our mechanical energy is staying the same. Similarly, if we look at momentum, again, if you think about, oh, I'm moving closer, right? So I'm going faster. Well, if I'm moving faster, that means my angular velocity is increasing. Also, when I'm closer, our inertia, our rotational inertia, is going to be less, right? Because our radius is smaller. So if our omega is up, our inertia is down, then our angular momentum, again, is going to stay the same. Same thing when you're moving away, or I guess the opposite, right? Our angular velocity would be decreasing, our inertia would be increasing, rotational inertia increasing, and our angular momentum would be staying the same. So these are the most common questions you should expect to see on the circular motion slash gravitational units. I don't expect you to see all of these, but for sure you should see two or three of these. So let me know in the comments below. Once you've taken the test, write me a little message. Did you see any of these? Did you see all of these? In fact, if you saw none of these, please dislike this video because I will make some changes. All right, good luck, everybody.